So again, like I said, I'm Dr. Hunter Peterson. I'm the Clinic Director of Coeur d'Alene Healing Arts. <clears throat> and this is the Open Forum, a monthly chat with one of our doctors about health and health topics. Um, <clears throat> I came prepared to talk about a really powerful tool that I use every day in my practice called homeopathic medicine that is a thing that I think all of us actually could learn how to use and utilize in our homes. Um, and it's such a powerful medicine and broad topic that it'll be hard to really narrow down how to talk about this, um, I guess, in a more, most succinct way. But I think I'm gonna try to make our conversation mostly center around how to use homeopathic medicines in the setting of acute illnesses. Um, so what I mean by that is kind of how you take care of your health when an acute complaint pops up. And most of the time when we think about acute illnesses, um, a lot of what we're thinking about is infections. We're thinking about sore throats, sinus infections, ear infections, we're thinking about um, lung infections. We are thinking about urinary tract infections. We're thinking about intestinal infections and diarrhea and sore, painful tummies and nausea. Um, and, and then maybe as a separate area that doesn't have to do with infections, we're talking about um, more like blunt trauma, like uh, sprains and strains and bruises and burns. Um, you know, and that really encompasses a huge degree of acute ailments. Um, homeopathy really can be used in almost any acute setting to um, help the body rapidly repair and heal from um, a, a stressor or a form of, you know, invasion to the body. So, that is kind of where I want to center our conversation today is through the homeopathic treatment of acute illnesses. Um, I think for matter of uh, kind of, well, I'll just say not wanting to overload our topic, I want to maybe set a little disclaimer about what I'm not going to be including in our conversation today. Um, and maybe a good preface for that is to really tell you that this topic I'm kind of going over, I taught over the, it was gosh, over five years ago, but I taught as a six week, two hour per lecture course. So it was a, you know, 12 hour course with a bunch of materials to complement. And, and I do want to reteach it someday. It's called Home Sweet Homeopathy. I think one of the lectures is actually up on our website that we did go ahead and post. I co-taught it with my dear friend, mentor, predecessor, an incredible homeopathic doctor, uh, Dr. Todd Schlapfer, who founded this clinic. And so we co-taught that, I think in 2015. So this is a lot of material and by necessity, I'm just gonna have to kind of simplify it and give you guys the most information that will most help you get out and go on your own to play with this. And again, I hope to teach a more comprehensive class someday. So um, keep tuned to our, our, um, our newsletter outreach uh, listserv because I will announce when I teach classes and that kind of thing there. Um, so usually if we're gonna talk through the different conditions you can use homeopathy to treat, we would actually wanna talk about the conditions and like, you know, how they appear, what their signs and symptoms are, what kind of, you know, natural, like just holistic kind of naturopathic treatment options that are not homeopathy we would use. We might talk about conventional treatment options. We might talk about the, you know, the really urgent signs and symptoms of like something more serious that can't be managed at home. Um, those are all fairly important concepts, but again, if I'm gonna try to tackle, 
you know, 10 or 12 different times of acute conditions, I just don't think I can go through all those details and talk about homeopathy. So, you know, I, I just would, I would make this caveat that anytime you are treating an acute illness on your own, your own illness, and you really, it's, it's interesting because one of the most helpful things is like, if you really experience a sensation of dread and something really being, you know, incredibly wrong with your health, like you really feel your vitality sapped in a, a really, you know, intensive way, especially partway into an acute illness where things go downhill really, really fast. And again, there's a lot of ways you could dictate that with, um, you know, inability to get fluids in with like, really like altered mental status with labored breathing, with, um, you know, blue tingeness to the skin with drops in oxygen levels, um, with severe pain emerging. Um, you know, there, there's, there's a lot of signs potentially, but I just really want to encourage and urge everyone, this is an important time to reach out to your doctor. And while we're not an urgent care clinic, um, we are able to accommodate acute illnesses usually every day between one of our doctors with naturopathic treatment. So Monday through Friday, that usually can be an option for you if it happens in the daytime. And of course, if it's evenings and weekends and it feels serious enough, obviously urgent care settings are a really good place to approach for care, even if their model might not use some of the philosophy and tools that we think work the most effectively. So, um, you know, that's my disclaimer caveat that um, seeking medical intention if you're unsure of your prognosis or how you're moving through an illness is always advised. And just to make sure our patients know that naturopathic medicine is so amazing at treating acute illness and helping it resolve more fully and quickly. And, and I include serious acute illnesses, you know, pneumonia, bronchitis, um, urinary tract, kidney infections. Um, it's, it's just, there's, we can really take on pretty much any acute condition. And if we don't feel like we can, we'll let you know. Um, and there's always that rare case, you know, handful of times a year where I'm prescribing a medication from a pharmacy, if, if we really feel like it gets there, but most of the time we don't need those tools. And we'll, at least if I treat you, my style will be to combine naturopathic therapeutics, which are many, with homeopathy often to get the really very best results. And that, as a naturopathic doctor, I feel very fortunate to have such a wide toolbox. Um, so that is our topic, medically speaking, is acute illnesses. But the tool that we're really going to go into depth about today is homeopathy. And so let me teach a little bit about the history of homeopathy to begin with, and then build into an understanding of how we apply these medicines. Um, so I'm a big medical anthropology, medical history junkie, and I love studying how the healing of human beings has evolved over the centuries. And if you go back not too far into our past, <laughs> it would be arguable that you would be better off not going to the doctor if you were ill than going to the doctor because a lot of the tools that you were used were pretty crude, pretty harmful, and often made or caused people to get sicker or even die. Um, for example, let's just say in the 1700s, um, if you were to become ill with infection of various types that became progressive, you would be looking at either bloodletting, meaning draining your body of blood, because that's how you would, you know, drain the infection, or you would be encouraged to take arsenic or mercury, which were then very strong purgatives to quote unquote, purge the infection out of your body, um, or drink copious amounts of alcohol and use other generally toxic substances. So really 
I think that context is important because the emergence of homeopathy came a long time ago into our medical repertoire. In fact, um, the founder of homeopathic principles, who's named Samuel Hahnemann, a German physician, um, emerged this medical model around um, the year 1790 or a little before that. And so that's the context is, you know, the, the doctors of the time were literally killing their patients. So when this new tool emerged, it was a massive um, transformative awareness that came into being. And amazingly, and just as a testament to how powerful this medicine is, it, it maintains today as one of the very best therapeutic tools available to us. Um, very shunned in the conventional medical world, homeopathy, um, for many reasons I could get into, uh, not ones that I want to, I guess, validate or even spend a lot of our time on because I'm just going to really share, you know, and, and hopefully build trust with you that as a really highly trained, experienced clinician using homeopathy daily for 10 years, I have found it to be an enormously powerful and useful medical tool that dramatically improves outcomes for both chronic but also acute diseases. In one way that it's criticized is to be told, well, homeopathy is placebo. That's all it is, meaning, oh, it's all in your mind. Well, my refuting of that is I've used homeopathy a lot on my pets and patients' pets, and they respond beautifully to it, very powerfully and effectively. So how can you argue there's a placebo effect when you're giving homeopathics to your dogs and your cats? I would argue that is a really good refutation of that, that kind of criticism leveled at homeopathy. Nevertheless, um, I'm gonna go into the actual medicine here and really spend the bulk of our time in that conversation. So again, going back to Samuel Hahnemann, the founder of this medical model, he was kind of a very brilliant and experimenting kind of guy. And he was reading about this specific bark from a Peruvian tree called Chinchona. And it was touted as a cure for malaria, which at the time was one of the most serious um, infections that killed many, many countless people. And physicians were finding that giving patients um, the bark of chinchona tree would help cure their malaria symptoms and they resolve the disease. And the physicians of the time claimed it was because of the astringency of chinchona that created that. Hahnemann was skeptical because he said, I know a lot of other herbs and medicinal plant extracts that are much more bitter and astringent than chinchona. So that can't be the reason. So he did something really interested in, in like many <laughs> experimenters, he started experimenting on himself and he started taking chinchona bark every day in a healthy state, started taking doses of it. And as he started taking it, what happened was incredibly interesting. He started developing all of the symptoms of malaria to a T. And so this is where he came up with a brilliant theory and I don't know how he made this connection, but he made the hypothesis that if a healthy person takes a substance over and over repeatedly and certain symptoms appear in their health, they get, for example, with chinchona, intermittent fevers, um, coated tongue, sweating, um, flu-like symptoms, like, if those symptoms get presented and they mimic the symptoms of an actual disease, he made the hypothesis that if we give the sick person with the disease the substance that mimics those symptoms, then the person who receives that substance, who has the disease, will have a cure. So it was really radical thinking for the time because at the time, most of the, the, the cures were given in ways that were designed to suppress the symptoms, not mimic the symptoms. So 
indeed, Hahnemann went and tested that theory and gave people, like he was told, chinchona, causing those same symptoms of malaria in a healthy person, and, and all these people recovered. Um, and so that's where he came about the core principle of homeopathic medicine, which is this concept of like cures like, meaning that when you give an ill person a medicine that in a healthy person creates those same symptoms of illness, then it actually activates the body into recognizing, responding to, and removing the acute illness from the body. And so there's where this concept of like cures like comes into play. And of course, the other genius of his methodology, Hahnemann's that is, in terms of how to create homeopathic medicines was that he also learned that you did not need to have a high concentrate of the crude substance to precipitate this like cures like response. In fact, he found that if you gave people very high crude doses, it actually could cause what's called an aggravation of the person's symptoms and there could be side effects from the crude substance. For example, we already talked about one of the substances called ars arsenic. Well, arsenic ha happens to be an incredibly powerful homeopathic medicine when prescribed homeopathically. However, if given in tr crude doses, it is poisonous and toxic. So the second brilliant thing he came about hypothesizing and learning is that if he prepared the homeopathic remedies in a specific method of dilution, that he could maintain the signature of their action in the like cures like response while diminishing the amount of crude substance given to the patient. And so how he did this was he did serial dilutions of the crude substance in one to 100 ratios. And how that was done was he took a vial of medicine. I have a little homeopathic right here. This is a vial of granules and it has little, little pellets in here. So he medicated, or so he, this is the actual substance medicine, but let's say this was filled with water. He'd take one drop of water, of, of sorry, of the remedy out of here, mix it with a hundred drops of pure alcohol extract, and then vigorously shake it up about 150 times, which would transmit the memory of that substance into the dilution. And then he'd take another vial filled with 100 drops of um, pure alcohol extract, would take one drop from the previous dilution and make another dilution. And you could go on and on with this 50 times, 100 times, and make higher and higher dilutions. The real key about this methodology was the vigorous shaking, which was known as potentizing, is known as potentizing the medicine or succussion. And at the time it wasn't known how this worked medically or scientifically, but now we actually have pretty good evidence about how this works through nanotechnology and through harmonic resonance theories that is now well proven in physics. So indeed, we're, ever to, we're able to translate through the medium of water the actual electromagnetic frequency of a substance so that it still maintains its therapeutic action in interacting with the body. And the best way that I can explain that is to really articulate really what we are as living beings, which is all substances that exist resonate at different electromagnetic frequencies. All of our cells, all of our tissues, all of our organs, every infinite part of our beings has a resonant frequency. And a lot of what causes change and interaction of our cells and tissues and being on a physical, mental, and emotional plane is through a resonant electromagnetic frequency. So if you think about how homeopathic medicines are prepared and made, it really brings a pretty rational understanding of how these medicines can exert an action on the body. And it really sits well with that theory 
of how the homeopathic medicine, when properly selected, ignites or stimulates a healing response by the body. In the way that I like to think about it, in how Hahnemann described it in his writing, is an acute illness is a misattunement of the resonant frequency of the body. The illness brings about a misattunement of that electromagnetic harmonizing in the body. And until that misattunement is rebalanced and reorganized back to a natural state, disease and illness is gonna um, be able to sustain. So if you're able to hone in on that specific resident frequency and put a stimulus into the body that alerts it to that misattunement and helps reorganize it, then the body will move toward a state of resolution and balance and harmony very efficiently. And that is the way I would describe homeopathic medicine as working. And so what these medicines are, are various substances. They are um, plant materials, they are animal materials, and they are mineral materials derived from nature. And so at the crude level, that's what they come from. And then we potentize them and succuss them like I discussed to create a homeopathic potency of the medicine. And eventually you take that alcohol extract and medicate these little granules that then are tapped out into a cap and put under the tongue, um, which I'll just take a dose of this medicine right now. And you let those little pellets melt under your tongue. And so what's really happening there is why we put it sublingually under the tongue is sub that area of the body is a very direct mode of absorption. The substance moves right into the bloodstream when applied sublingually. And so that tends to be why we dose homeopathics in that way. And, and so that's how the medicines are created. Now, how we select which medicines are used for which ailments is that we do experiments like what I told you Samuel Hahnemann did with chinchona bark. So we take the substance that's been prepared homeopathically and we give it to healthy people. And we start to record the symptoms they start to develop. Maybe someone develops redness of the cheeks, someone develops swelling of the ankles, someone develops irritability, someone develops aversion to cold, right? As they keep taking this remedy over and over and you go and record all those symptoms and it, you end up creating a map of how that remedy uniquely presents in the body, um, basically in a healthy person. Now the real key here, and again, the genius of homeopathy is we take that totality of symptom presentation and when someone presents to us who is ill, we inventory all of those total of symptoms and we select which of the many remedies we have homeopathically that mimic and match those symptoms so we can apply the law of like cures like. And so then we dispense that medicine, we have someone take it sublingually, um, and then the hope is if it is the correct remedy, if it resonates with that misattuned frequency in the body, then you lead to a resolution of symptoms much more quickly because the homeopathic medicine is stimulating a reorganization in the body, um, which, you know, let's say in the case of a bronchitis where you have bacteria in the bronchioles, that reorganization of the body basically energizes the immune system to disband those bacteria and clear them from your body. So it's really stimulating our own body's vital force, as Hahnemann termed it, our own vital healing capacity, which is also wonderful because any medicine that can catalyze and activate our own body's healing ability is going to be the lowest force and hopefully most efficient way to restore health. Um, so it's 
that, that's kind of, you know, our, our methodology to homeopathy. And I think what I want to mention to you all now is how we go about selecting remedies in different condition states. Um, and so one of the things I want to show you is this really great diagram. Um, let's see, I need to share my screen. So um, this is called a Benninghausen diagram. Um, let me expand it. Hopefully you can see the whole thing. Okay, good enough. So you can see four quadrants here. And this is basically if you're a beginning homeopath and you want to use homeopathy at home, this is a great little template to have anytime you're seeking to use homeopathy to treat a condition. So there's a term one of the really famous homeopaths came up with that in order to accurately prescribe, because remember we have hundreds and hundreds of these remedies and you wanna find the remedy that resonates with the disease frequency. And there's only gonna be one remedy that does that. So you can't just take all of them at once. You really wanna do a detailed assessment of the unique presenting symptoms of the patient. And so those kind of methods of assessment are, first of all, the condition, right? So we could say upper respiratory infection, you know, sore throat, um, earache. Um, we could say bruised left knee, um, but we could get pretty specific about where it is. Maybe if it's a sore throat, we could say it's a sore throat on the left side, right? So the more specific, the better. Um, and the more, I guess, the more information you get about the symptoms, the more likely you will be to arrive at the correct remedy. Um, the net, so that's the upper left quadrant, the locality, but also the condition, like what the actual process is. Then you would go to the descriptors, okay, which the descriptors are, hey, it is, let's say that um, you are having a, um, a cough, right? And so is the cough painful? Is it uh, productive? Does it come, does, does it produce a lot of phlegm? Is it deep in your chest? Is it dry? Is it hacking? Um, you know, getting to those more refined descriptions, or if say you have a a stomach ache, um, you're having abdominal pain, like with an acute gastroenteritis, does it feel sharp? Does it feel stabbing? Does it feel dull? Does it feel aching? Does it feel pulsating? Um, right, so all of those really specific refined descriptors will help you define, again, those really nuanced specifics to help select the remedy. Then there's what's called concomitants. And the word concomitant is things that come along with the chief complaint. So say the chief complaint is a child with an earache, but that child is also incredibly irritable. Um, that child also wants comfort. They want to be held and they want to be carried. Um, they, they don't wanna be left alone. Um, let's see, along with the earache, they're having loose stool or diarrhea, um, and along with the earache, they're having a fever, right? These are all accompanying symptoms, not directly related to the chief complaint. Okay, so those are concomitants. And then lastly, there's modality and causation. And what that means is what makes it better and what makes it worse. So again, going back to the earache, or maybe we'll just say, um, well, maybe say a cough. Maybe we find that the cough feels better out in open cold air. Maybe it feels worse in a warm stuffy room. Maybe the cough feels better drinking hot drinks. Maybe it feels worse drinking hot drinks. Maybe it feel, the cough is worse when lying down. Maybe the cough is better when sitting up. 
right? So we have like all of these different ways where you can describe what makes the condition that we're trying to resolve better or worse. So ideally, when you're, when you're inventorying the symptoms of an acute illness, to select which homeopathic is most appropriate, you're going to want to gather as much information in these four quadrants as possible. And like, like I mentioned, you're wanting to get at least three of these quadrants, some pretty specific information. And the reason the term three-legged stool is made as in three quadrants is, you know, that's a pretty firm, you know, stool if you have three legs. If you have two, it's really wobbly. If you have one, it is incredibly precarious. And so your likelihood of arriving at the correct remedy is much less if you only have really one good specific symptom to go off of. So the more the better. Um, so once you have all this information, what do you do with that? Well, this is the part where I wish we had a six week lecture class because I would go into teaching you all about the remedies. And I would tell you about some of the kind of, you know, best remedies that are used in the acute world of illnesses. And we talk all about their features. Um, what is unique in the what's called the proving, right? When we give the healthy people this medicine, what types of patterns present? Um, and so the whole art of homeopathy is really learning each of these remedies in detail. And so that when you go to having an acute illness, you can, based on the symptoms, match up the illness with the homeopathic medicine that's going to resonate with the illness frequency and therefore help the body resolve it. So we're going to go over one of them just as an example so you can kind of get a feel for this. This is called belladonna, one of the very best homeopathic remedies available to us, also known as the deadly nightshade. Um, it, is a, it is a flower, it is a plant, and in, again, in crude, crude doses is poisonous. But when given homeopathically is an incredibly powerful medicine for healing. And so if we look at belladonna and we go through the four quadrants, we see that the types of conditions we, we think about for belladonna is anywhere there's localized inflammations, really good for headaches, fevers, sore throats, earaches, colds, flus, coughs, um, abscesses and boils, and versions of delirium. And when we describe if a condition presents, such as any of those, the way that they tend to look is the person needing belladonna with one of these conditions is gonna have the affected part look hot, red, swollen, throbbing, or dry. It's gonna appear very suddenly and disappear very suddenly. So it's a very rapid starting illness. Um, again, if with headaches, there's a lot of congestion to it. There's a lot of throbbing. The face is red, hot, and dry. Um, if, it's a, if, it's a, if it's a sore throat, it's painful and very bright red. It's very dry. And because it's so dry, you wanna swallow or have drinks to relieve the dryness. And the tonsils in the back of the throats will be very bright red and very swollen, right? So you get this theme, right? If it's a headache, if it's a, if it's a, if it's a sore throat, like all of these conditions present in a very similar way. And interestingly, belladonna typically with whatever illness it is tends to be more right-sided in its presentation. Now, things that provoke it, make it worse or make it better, and again, it's helpful to understand the nomenclature here. If you have the, the kind of sideways arrow opening up to the right, it means worse from. And if you have the sideways arrow closing up to the right or opening to the left, it means better from. So that's important because I'm going to show you a little cheat sheet that I'm going to encourage to have you call the clinic to have us email you. And that will be the nomenclature we use to say worse from or better from. So with belladonna, 
tends to be the illnesses are feel worse from motion or jarring, worse from uncovering, worse from heat, worse from light or noise, worse from touch, worse lying down, and worse in the afternoon or as the day goes on. Tends to be better when you're standing or sitting up and better from being covered. Okay, so that's an example of modalities, causation, better or worse, one of the legged stools we're going after finding. And then lastly, there's the concomitants. What are the other things that are often typical in a person presenting with an acute illness needing belladonna? So restlessness is a very characteristic um, symptom of belladonna. There's also a lot of suddenness and intenseness of the onset. In general, there's a lot of sensitivity to the pain. The pain is very prominent and complain very prominently. Oftentimes the eyes will look glassy, the pupils will be dilated, the face will be flushed. Um, people can actually become delirious even in a violent way when needing belladonna with an acute illness. There's a lot of spasms, jerks, and twitchings that can happen. There can be a hot head, but interesting cool extremities. And the tongue can be red with almost a strawberry-ish appearance. So these are all of the kind of classical characterizing symptoms of belladonna. Now, if I pull up a different remedy, you may see some overlap, right? There are other remedies that suddenly present themselves or have a lot of redness associated or have a lot of worse with motion and better with standing or sitting up. So it's, it's, it's what makes this a really tricky medicine to practice is a lot of times the symptoms overlap, but the more symptoms you have, the more specific you can get at honing in on which remedy is the most appropriate. And it's important to note that say someone comes in with a headache as their lead, or, or your acute symptom is a really bad headache, and it ends up that belladonna is the remedy needed. It does not mean that your headache will have all of these symptoms. Very much, I actually assure you, not all of them will be present, but a percentage of them will be. And in comparison to other remedies commonly seen with headaches, Belladonna will be the most characteristic symptoms that have the most alignment with the symptoms you're presenting as being ill. So you just have to be patient with recognizing, I practiced this for 15 years, and I would say that I frequently don't prescribe the appropriate remedy, which means that it's not really gonna do anything. It won't improve the symptoms more rapidly, but it won't make them get worse. Um, and so obviously the hope is that we select the correct remedy. And the way that we know we've selected the correct remedy is wherever the illness is at, at a pattern level, if it's been either, either worsening or really stagnant and stuck, when you start giving the right remedy, the symptoms will begin to improve relatively quickly with an acute illness. I usually say within 12 hours, Sometimes it's basically immediate. And whether that's, you know, say it's a, um, if it's a chest infection, secretions will be drying out, breathing will become easier, um, your energy will begin rising. And there's another really important feature, which is generalized sense of well being, a general sense of greater peace, greater calm, greater vitality will start to build in the patient. So again, tricky to fully understand that. And I can only say that experience helps you learn that. But it, I would say as a good, just general rule, if you feel that after taking a remedy for 24 hours, nothing has improved or there's been gradual worsening, likely you've not selected the correct remedy and you should probably move on to a different remedy. Um, in my experience, generally speaking, this isn't always true, but generally an acute illness will only need one correct remedy to move it to a complete resolution. You tend to not need to switch remedies as you go throughout. 
if you find the correct remedy, it is usually the correct remedy to bring it to a complete resolution. Now, when you give the remedy, it's a very big debate amongst homeopaths. How frequently do you give a remedy? Um, how and what potency? Remember how I said you use these dilution factors? Well, there's different dilution factors you can prescribe a homeopathic remedy in. It can be as low as 6C, which is six times 100 dilution, or six times of 100 to 1 dilution. It can be a 30 times of 100 to 1 dilution. It can be 200 times, 1,000 times. In acute settings, my general guidance is to give the 30th dilution or 30C of 100 to 1 dilution about three to four times a day or every three to four hours. And that's because with more acute illnesses that are on the physical level, we want to go with a lower potency and repeat them more frequently. That's just how I was trained. There's not necessarily a right or wrong way to do that, but that's how I choose to. It tends to be the higher potencies, meaning 200C, 1M, 50M, 10M. I tend to use higher potencies less frequently when treating chronic conditions and when treating conditions that are, are more centered in the mental and emotional sphere, for which homeopathy, by the way, is very, very effective in addressing chronic emotional and mental disturbance patterns. However, this lecture is about acute illnesses. So that's kind of, you know, the, um, the area that I'm going to kind of pause on and review. Um, so I want to just hold on for a sec, um, stop my screen share, see if there's any questions from anybody. And um, from there, um, go over a couple of of themes. And there was one question as a clarification, which is better from, worse from. So again, better from is, I'll put type it in as this symbol, which means the pointy part of the arrow is pointing to the right. Worse from is this symbol, which means the pointy part is pointing to the left. So just when you're seeing the cheat sheets, that's what to remember. Um, I am going to pull something up for y'all, which is a outline that I made. And you are welcome to, um, let me share this. You are welcome to request that the staff send you this remedy outline. So notice that today, I haven't talked about any specific conditions. I haven't talked about sore throats. I haven't talked about allergies. I haven't talked about sinusitis. I haven't talked about nausea, vomiting, abdominal pain, sprains, burns. But in the course, I go all over those in detail and I talk about each homeopathic medicine that is most commonly needed for each condition. And something I wanna point out here is that you'll notice that several of the remedies are used in several places. And this is a really powerful and awesome part of homeopathy that when you have a kit of remedies and the remedy kit that we have at the clinic is 35 remedies, you have remedies that will work for a multitude of conditions because the, the remedies have many actions, right? So they're not just specific to a certain condition. So for example, this remedy pulsatilla, which is a plant, is great for allergies, but it's also great for sinusitis. And it can also be used really well in urinary tract infections. Um, the remedy bryonia is great for coughs, but it's also great for influenza. Um, and so you can really use these remedies, again, based on their unique individual patterns of presentation to apply this, the illness specifics to which remedy is most closely resonant with that. Um, 
so I'm just kind of giving you this list and you're welcome to kind of ask the staff for a copy of this by email. This is a way where say you have a homeopathy book that tells you the features of each of these remedies, which I'm gonna go over some books that do that. Um, if you want to, if say your like, illness is diarrhea, then rather than looking at all 35 remedies, it's a good bet that one of these four remedies or Sinecum phosphorus sulfur veratrum are gonna be the best remedy for your diarrhea. Now, it's not always the case. There can be diarrhea that's gonna respond to a completely different homeopathic remedy. But what I've attempted to do in this outline is really say these are the biggest, most prominent remedies to consider in a given specific um, illness or, or type of acute presentation. And these are all the remedies we carry in our 35 remedy kit. So I just wanted to make you all aware of that and that it might be a nice resource if you want to build a little homeopathic pharmacy and have a homeopathic um, consultation manual that describes these remedies in depth, kind of like my little Belladonna um, outline, there's books that are really good at building this descriptors too. And I'll actually show you that and I will keep that as part of the, the um, thing you could ask the staff to send you, which is recommended reading. So specifically, Materia Medica is where you get to go read about the individual unique features of each of these medicines or each of these remedies. So really any of these Materia Medicas are great. You can get them on Amazon, they're inexpensive. If you wanna go even more specific and really have to do with just at home prescribing for acute illnesses, I particularly like this Everybody's Guide to Homeopathic Medicines. We sell it at the clinic and it's just, just for convenience and you can also get it online, but this will literally do a similar thing where it will break out the types of conditions and talk about the most common remedies per condition. Okay, so if you wanted to do this in a really you know, safe at-home environment and grow your homeopathic knowledge, this would be a great way to do it. And of course, you can also buy these homeopathic medicines over the counter at a place like Pilgrim's here in Coeur d'Alene or Huckleberry's in Spokane. Um, health food stores generally carry them, so you don't have to get the remedies from our clinic, but you're also always welcome to call in and purchase, I think they're $10 a remedy, um, a remedy from our clinic in the 30C potency. And, um, you know, this little vial actually is <laughs> very long lasting. You can actually take about 100 doses per vial. So they're very economical, and as long as they're st stored in a cool, dark place, they literally never go bad. They never be, become corrupted. They're all, they don't expire. So another reason I love homeopathy, it's safe, doesn't have side effects. It's very inexpensive. You have the medicines forever when, once you have them. Um, so there's one other really useful sheet. And again, I will encourage you if you want this sheet, and I'm happy to email it to you, email our staff at info at CDA Healing Arts. So info at CDA Healing Arts. And I'll just put our little website um, on the messages here. Um, info at cdahealingarts.com. Um, and you can get any of these breakdowns of these sheets, um, which include the, the homeopathic outline, um, the um, the the reading recommendations and the, then the kit guide. So if you were to want to purchase a kit, we do have them available at our clinic. They make lovely gifts. Um, they also, again, to me are very economical and efficient because once you have these remedies, you have them forever. Um, and so we include a kit with all of these remedies in a 30 C potency. And we're able to do a little discount on them. In, in other words, to offer them for more like $6 a remedy when we give them in the entire kit 
versus individually. I'm not trying to push that, but it's just a more economical way to get these remedies. And so this is a list of all the remedies, which should correspond pretty nicely to the outline of where we consider using these remedies. And what I've done here is I've done a super, super brief, simplified description of when to use these remedies. And again, your, your success rate is not gonna be extraordinarily high if you just rely on this, but you know, it's better than nothing. And so it gives you a kind of idea of, hey, um, this remedy, arsenicum 33, we might think of that when you get diarrhea, either from bad water or bad food, when you have that symptom, often there'll be weakness, restlessness, chilliness, a lot of the sensations will be burning and all the symptoms will feel better with warmth, right? So that's kind of a, a quick and dirty remedy picture for Seneca Malbec. Um, so again, you can look through this 35 remedy, you know, list and encourage you to ask the staff to send that, but those can help you out. And, and again, in certain situations, you'll get the remedy right and you'll experience the magic of a rapidly resolving illness by the appropriate um, like cures like homeopathic prescription. So I think that for the moment, that's a really good pausing point for the day and for this lecture and hopefully really getting you excited about a tool that I love and that I feel is incredibly effective. I use this in almost every acute illness I treat when a patient presents to me and I think much of the time, these homeopathic remedies are very, very profoundly helpful. Um, I especially love them because you can give them to infants and you can give them to kids and they love the taste because those little granules are little sugar pellets. And so turns out that kids respond beautifully to homeopathy. And it also turns out that a lot of people, the biggest challenge with acute illness is with their kiddos. And so having a homeopathic kit or knowledge of homeopathy can be absolutely, you know, just helpful as a parent in terms of caring for your ch children's well-being in resolving acute illnesses. Um, so again, um, covered a lot of ground, talked all things homeopathy today. Um, hopefully what you took away from this is there's a whole world of powerful medicines that have a very intelligent way of helping the body heal itself and restore itself to homeostasis and balance. And they're very safe, inexpensive and effective tools that can be used in the at-home setting. You don't need to be an expert or a doctor to utilize them. Um, and hopefully these resources that you would, if you'd like to reach out and receive some of them, I fully support you in, in, in reaching out to our clinic to grab um, some of those remedies um, if you want, or some of these handouts so you can um, successfully deploy this in the future for the health of yourself and your family. Um, so thank you all for tuning in. I will get this posted to the website in the next week or so and send out a little link by email when it's available. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording and let you all uh, keep enjoying this snowy, beautiful day. And uh, thank you for tuning in. Okay.